Well, if you'll just remain standing for uh, the reading of, of God's word from uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And uh, just while you're standing, just a, a note of uh, uh, pastoral care. And you think about um, uh, going through times of change as a church. Um, we're thankful that as a church, um, we've been able, I think in the first six and a half years, really to absorb uh, what the main things are, the, the plain things uh, in our understanding of the authority of Scripture and um, uh, the deity of Christ and, and the sufficiency of, of His blood atonement for us, necessity of faith. And I think the secondary matters that we think of as a church, especially in the life of the local church, um, changes such as website changes, uh, address changes, and other things uh, that come along with that. We're thankful that we have a church, I think, that uh, we're able to navigate those changes, and as bumps come, uh, we take them all in perspective. Uh, Chris has done a wonderful job at uh, really providing behind the scenes all of the, uh, the care and content and question asking and answering that, that uh, regards that, which I'm thankful for. And I think as we go through this as a congregation, there's always going to be some bumps with, with all change, and uh, we'll, we'll figure our way through it. Uh, but we continue to exercise the same uh, patience and care as, as God does with us. Now, as we think about the scripture this morning, just a couple of verses that we'll uh, look at uh, from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Paul writes, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Amen. You may be seated. I think the, um, one of the things that, that um, I sometimes neglect in sending a, an email is the, the little matter of the subject line. Sometimes I go right to the content, and uh, as soon as I hit the send button, there's a little prompt that comes up that says, Basically, are you going to leave this field blank? And sometimes I even say out loud to the computer, yes. And then I hit the send button anyway. And I think one of the, um, ch the challenges of preaching through a book of the Bible is trying to summarize the subject matter of it in just a few words. And, uh, and Chris and I have, uh, have, have gone through this exercise now quite a bit. And, and he's asked me very graciously, you know, do you think there'll be a theme for the, for the Bible book we're looking at, or how do we summarize that for uh, our website? And if, if at this point we were going to put a subject field uh, for, for an email uh, for the book of 1 Timothy, I might, I might just say it this way, it's just for the church, for the church, uh, really because there are specific instructions that are coming for the church. But when you think about um, Paul's uh, authoritative speaking and writing uh, as an apostle, what he's trying to do is, is, is to build up the church. So everything he's talking about and writing about really is for the benefit of the local church, not only back then, but, but now. And, and, and a couple of weeks ago, we, we got to um, really kind of a wrap-up part of uh, the first section of 1 Timothy 1, where he ends with a doxology saying, To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. And what he was really doing was, I think, crystallizing a sense of worship that he has when he thought about being the chief of sinners as a persecutor, a blasphemer, someone who was trying to, to kill the church, literally, and, and was turned graciously back to the Lord Jesus Christ. His life dramatically changed. And now he's put in this position to build it up. And as he thought about all that, it, it brought him to a place of personal worship, total transformation. And as we think about that here this morning, um, I, I think you, you, he starts to take a little shift. He start, he's moving from the personal greeting now uh, to really what Timothy is supposed to focus on as he's building up the church, as he's, as he's instructing the church and, and teaching. And so I've, I've just really, in a sense, a little bit thematically, even for the morning, the, the, the phrase came to mind, first things first, Timothy, first things first. And maybe for all of us as well. When we think about the building up of a local church body, we think about even our own sense of participation. You know, what, what do we bring? What do, do, what, what do I as an individual bring to the church? You've got to keep first things first. And first thing, very, very first thing, 
And this is what I, I really appreciate the way Paul starts this next section and then really gets into the bulk of the actual teaching about the affairs of the church. First thing, first thing, Timothy, first thing for you, first thing for me, is to fight the good fight of faith personally. Now, in the ESV, it's a, it's a little inelegant. Uh, it says wage good warfare. But I, I like the way other translations put fight the good fight. Because when you think about it, there's, there's two places where this, this war is going to be waged, this battle is going to be had. The first is going to be within us, inside our own souls. Am I willing to engage in that battle, to fight the good fight, to hold on to my faith, and to develop a sensitive conscience? That's, that is number one. No matter what happens inside the local church, all the affairs, all the different things that take place, disagreements, joys, pain, what have you, the real, the real responsibility that you and I have is to fight the good fight privately and personally. And then the second thing, that there's going to be some um, times of, of battle inside the walls of the church about certain kinds of people that are being dis, dis, divisive. Now, thankfully, this, this is not taking place in our church. But it's taken place in the church in Ephesus. And Paul's, I think, helping Timothy understand that there's going to be a good fight that, that happens inside his own soul. And then there's going to be a, a good fight, if you like, that is waged inside the walls of the church to make sure that the church understands the authority of the very prophecies that led to him being put into place for leadership. The authority of God's word in that way was going to be the bedrock of the church moving forward? Were they going to trust in the sufficiency of the word of God to put Paul in place and then, then, then consequently Timothy in place? Were they going to trust in the authority of the scripture as it related to these specific issues that the church was dealing with? Or were they going to come up with their own ideas, their own plans, their own uh, applications and start to run that way. And two individuals were doing that here. And so Paul had to call them out. And so really, I think the good fight is waged not only privately and personally, but also then inside the walls. Before even thinking about confronting what's outside the church, she's got to figure out what's happening internally first. So here, uh, the beginning of the first uh, fight, the first thing first here, Paul says, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Well, this is what I just, I call the, the handoff. Um, Paul's like a spiritual father talking to a spiritual son, saying, I'm taking these instructions, I mean, I'm entrusting them to you now. I can't be there, but you're going to be the one in leadership taking care of this. And the first fight is going to begin with you. All the doubts, all the insecurities, all the ways you question yourself, you're, you're going to have to hold on to your faith. And you're going to have to continue to develop a sound conscience. conscience. Timothy had been appointed by the moving of God and, in the leadership of the church by what Paul says are the prophecies. Other people are going to come along and say, no, I have knowledge, I have giftedness, I have ability, I have money, I have influence. Why don't you let me take the church over? Timothy's just a young man. He doesn't really know what he's doing. But we've been here for a while. And in fact, God's told me some things. And I think those things need to be talked about in the church. In fact, maybe what Timothy's even saying here, I don't think God's saying. But let me say it. That kind of thing was rampant in the early church where there was a struggle taking place. And Paul is reminding Timothy that the instructions that were coming to him came from the foundation of the mouth of God through the prophetic witness that was unique to the first, uh, first century. We don't know exactly what the prophetic words were or when exactly they were given, but we at least know that there was a charge of leadership that was entrusted to Timothy in the presence of elders and witnesses. And this was coming from the, 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 at the behest of God uh, to these individuals. 
And the battle uh, that Timothy was going to have to wage was the first one in his own soul with his faith and with, with his conscience. This is the second time uh, in this chapter that the word conscience is, is used as the word. And I still, I like the word because I think it's so helpful. The, the, the original idea is two words brought together called to know with. Your conscience is, is in a sense to know with. It's almost like having someone or something be an alert or a warning system for you. So as your conscience gets more sensitive, that warning system is able to trigger things that you recognize are going against the will of God. And, and if you think about it, like as the, the nervous system, you know, the pain sensors that, that alert us to the fact that something is malfunctioning in our body, in the same way the conscience is to our souls that kind of sensor to say, something distressing is happening here because you're going against what God's will is or what he's revealed in his word to your life. And so the awareness of that is absolutely critical. But the conscience isn't like the, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other having a conversation. The conscience is simply the warning system of what you already know to be true in your own heart. And that even begs, I think, a deeper question. Deeper question is this. What is informing your heart as it relates to the truth in God's will? Because your conscience is going to be a, a revealer of, of what you know to be true. And I think as we get into these two individuals, Hymenaeus and Alexander, they had things that were informing their heart as to what they believed to be the truth, but it really wasn't that at all. And so they had rejected their conscience. It said no to those things. Because something was already informing them that was dead wrong. But this warning system, Paul is saying, you have to make sure your warning system is right. Because you're going to have to wage a battle within your own soul about all your doubts and all your insecurities. And, uh, and, and most importantly, your sin. You're going to have to deal with it. Your faith will be a weapon too, Timothy. It will be like a shield. The question is, you know, Timothy, what have you come to believe in? Or maybe even more importantly, who have you come to believe in? You need a conscience to keep you aware of what's right and wrong, but you need your faith to keep you aware of who will empower you and who will forgive you when you've gone wrong. And the real question for any person entering a church is, in their belief system, fundamentally, do they believe that they make the atonement for their own sin? Or do they believe that Jesus has done it? Your very approach to church will be dramatically different in the way you answer those questions. If you come to a church believing that you make the atonement for your own sin, you dig yourself out of your own hole, you will look at the church as something that you just have to do in order to appease God. You'll look at your involvement that way. It will always be a burden that you carry. A person who's working in a church will even have a bigger burden to carry because they will use the affairs of the church as the way of leveraging that burden. People do this a lot. But what Paul is saying to Timothy is faith is your shield in this battle. The very reminder of the fact that Jesus has made the atonement for your sin, that ministry is not the way to forgiveness. Your ministry is the proclamation of it in the person of Jesus. The more you recognize that personally and privately, the better minister you're going to be. And if you think about it for you as an attender here, the more you recognize that personally and privately, the better and more productive Christian you're going to be here. And you may come here not even having come to the conclusion yet, but having a burden that you cannot bear. Because you've recognized what's happened in your life that you cannot reconcile. You've gone against the design of your body, the design of the will of God for your life, and you don't know what to do. So the, the, a logical conclusion would be coming to a place like this. But coming to a place like this won't actually solve your problem. It might even make you more, uh, have more of a sense of a burden. Because you might look around and think, 
I'll never measure up to these people. Well, I got news for you. We, we, none of us measure up to anybody else. We start looking at each other. The measure is to the perfection of Jesus, which we all fall short on. And the first realization that we have to come to is that. That he's made the, the atonement. He's made the sacrifice so that we can be set free. Your faith is a reminder of that. The greatest gift, the greatest gift, that Timothy could give to his congregation is his awareness of that, followed by personal holiness. The greatest gift that I could give to you is the awareness of that and my personal holiness. You can forget about giftedness. You can forget about the length of the service and all the accoutrements that go along with it. A new location, a new website, all that is secondary. The greatest gift that I could ever give to you is personal holiness. And, and, pe and people will sometimes ask me, you know, how can I pray for you? And that's a great question. And I can answer it right now. You can pray that my and Chris's personal holiness, as well as Rob and Will, will continue to grow and increase. And by the way, the greatest gift that you can give to your family to your job, your nieces and nephews, grandkids. Greatest gift that you can give to your spouse or a future spouse is your personal holiness. Think about it. Your approach in what you do with a good conscience and a sincere faith will be the best thing you ever do walking into any situation you find yourself in. People will not be able to articulate a, a, a bit of thanks for it. And, and please hear me clearly. You will get pushback and criticism for it. But don't let it stop you. People won't understand why you're making the decisions why, that you're making. They won't understand the conclusions that you're coming to. And this is certainly, I'm not calling you to be uh, obnoxious about it. I'm saying personally and privately, deal with your sin. Remember that Christ has made the atonement. Repent of it, confess it, and turn away from it. Run from it. And you'll give the greatest uh, gift you can, you can ever give to the people around you. Robert Murray McShane, pastor, author, not living, uh, said, the greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. Kevin DeYoung, pastor, author, and living, said, my congregation needs me to be more humble than smart, they need me to be more honest than dynamic. And he had a, a litany of other things. But I'll just stop there. Because we often look at the giftedness of people to think that that's their greatest contribution to whatever organization that they're in, situation. And for believers, our metric is completely different. It's all of what's happening in the personal battle that we're, that we're waging privately. First fight, first thing first, fight inside yourself. The second thing, then, is the fight of faith inside the church walls in a, in a corporate sense. This would be against the opposition. There were two main people that were rejecting conscience and, and making uh, a, a shipwreck of their faith. He says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to, that they may not learn how to blaspheme. And now, how, how, do, how, do people, how do people make a shipwreck of their faith? Well, one of the first things that normally goes is their conscience. They stop being sensitive and aware of the will of God, the word of God, the prompting of God in their life. All right, we can't make a comment on we're... Uh, where, where did they profess faith to be believers and then turn back on it? Uh, we, don't, we don't know what their eternal standing was before um, or, or after this pronouncement was made, but what we know in a broader sense that what was informing their hearts as to right and wrong, they had moved on to something else. They had rejected conscience and rejected the authoritative word that was coming from Paul and the elders to have Timothy put in place to do what he was called to do. Their warning system 
may have been malfunctioning, their warning system may have been turned off completely. But that starts to happen when your conscience becomes dull. To be handed over to Satan seems like a dramatic way of, of putting things, but I think the basic idea behind that is, is that Hymenaeus and Alexander were going to be released to serve the authority they were already serving. In other words, there came a point in time inside the local church for two people who were being that uh, divisive to say to everyone else, their motivations and what they're teaching and what they're trying to do is, is not of the Lord. And if you're not of the Lord, then you're of the evil one. So in a sense, Timothy, you've been, the, the, the truth has been handed over to you. The instruction's been given to you. Here's this charge. What's been, what, the other hand over here is, is where is the authority in the realm that, they're, that we're handing them over to. And that's, it's a fairly um, straightforward and uh, pretty stark way of putting it. But I, I, I really think, as I thought about it more and more through um, this, this past week, is that this really seems like almost the end of the church discipline process that Jesus instituted in Matthew chapter 18. The part where you specifically tell, um, you tell it to the church. That is, there's an unrepentant uh, person in your midst, and there's um, something that's happening so publicly that it requires a, a public rebuke. It requires public information um, to be shared because there's such a public disruption. And I think as a good rule, it's, it's good when we think about um, the more private uh, the sin, the more private the rebuke, the more private the confrontation. The more public and divisive, uh, the more public there may be to, um, to be confronted and, and called out. And I don't mean all the dirty laundry aired, but at least people need to know because there are a couple of people here, and when you call them by name, by the way, people would have known who they are. So as this is read publicly, everybody would know who Hymenaeus is. Everybody would know who Alexander is. And, and they would know exactly the realm to which they were being released back into. That they weren't to have a place of teaching or authority inside the church in, in Ephesus. But there's always a hope at the end of the, the process of, of discipline. And the hope is, is put right here at the end of verse 20. I have handed over to Satan... I've handed them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. In other words, people see at the end of, I think, um, a, a church discipline process, it, there, there's a sobriety to it. Um, there's a sense of finality to it. Maybe some confusion. But we should never lose sight of the fact that there is a hope in it. That as the church makes... Uh, a, a necessary corrective, or at least uh, a broadcasting of um, where a divisive person or a divisive action needs to be publicized, that there's always a hope in it that whoever is uh, the perpetrator of that would learn not to do that anymore. That that is improper behavior for the fellowship. And I'm sure if you've been around a church for a while, you've seen the good and the bad and the ugly of this process. I certainly have. I'm thankful, though, that when I got to Parkside back in 2002, that I, I watched a, a group of elders wrestle through particular situations. That everyone to a person was willing to really agonize through the process because it was about the people. It wasn't about, you know, just making a corporate decision in order to sort of clean things up. And I've, I always appreciated that and the deliberation of things that it took so long. It took so long because it was an agonizing process because people's lives were affected. And I'm certainly not going to tell you that it all happened, you know, in, in the most ideal way. I don't think any elder from Parkside Church would, would stand up and tell you that. 
that there were bumps along the way. There were things that maybe people thought they wished they would have done differently. But be that as it may, it was a process, I think, that was necessary in the church, but it came with some hope. And, and here's the thing. I, I think at the bottom, at the bottom of these, these, this process, and I think even at the bottom of where Paul is with, with Hymenaeus and Alexander, while, while the issues could be about what they were teaching, what they were getting from Genesis with different myths and genealogies or whatever, whatever that was, the bottom of it was, do you really recognize God's word through the apostles and prophets as authoritative? or not? Do you want to take it and twist it in a way that's going to suit you and your standing in the culture? Or do you really, are you going to stand with it? Are you going to stand for it? Because you know that probably by doing so, you're going to take a lot of flack and opposition. A lot of people are going to reject you. Jesus himself said, you're going to be hated by all on account of me. So it's not like it was going to be any secret or a surprise, but the real question is, are we going to stand for the authority of Scripture or not? I, I've been um, really intrigued by, and sh- I was kind of shocked by the way the vote went within the United Methodist Church uh, this past week. I, I guess surprised and shocked in a good way that there, were, there was enough uh, in, in the delegation to pursue um, a traditional understanding of the Word of God as it related to the issue of homosexuality. And I, I was just very struck by um, one, one um, speech that was given by uh, the, a, a dean in the, in the Liberian Methodist Seminary. His name was um, Dr. Jerry Kula. And I, I, I just I read the speech, and then I just copied and pasted it because I thought it was really good to read. Here's an African uh, brother speaking, uh, speaking, speaking at this um, gathering. He says, While we commit ourselves to be in ministry for all and with all persons, we do not celebrate same-sex marriages or ordain for ministry people who self-avow as practicing homosexuals. These practices do not conform to the authentic teaching of the Holy Scriptures, our primary authority for faith and Christian living. However, we extend grace to all people because we know all are sinners in need of God's redeeming. We know how critical and life-changing God's grace has been in our own lives. We warmly welcome all people to our churches. We long to be in fellowship with them, to pray with them, to weep with them, and to experience the joy of transformation with them. And then he, he really says, friends, please hear me. We Africans are not afraid of our sisters and brothers who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, questioning, or queer. We love them, and we hope the best for them. But we know of no compelling arguments for forsaking our church's understanding of Scripture and the teachings of the church universal. And then please hear me when I say as graciously as I can, we Africans are not children in need of Western enlightenment, when it comes to the church's sexual ethics. We do not need to hear a progressive U.S. bishop lecture us about our need to grow up. We stand with our Filipino friends. We stand with our sisters and brothers in Europe and Russia. And yes, we stand with our allies in America. We stand with farmers in Zambia, tech workers in Nairobi, Sunday school teachers in Nigeria, biblical scholars in Liberia, pastors in the Congo, United Methodist women in the Ivory Coast, and thousands of other United Methodists across Africa who have heard no compelling reasons for changing our sexual ethics, our teaching on marriage, and our ordination standards. We are grounded in God's word and the gracious and clear teachings of our church. On that, we will not yield. We will not take a road that leads us from the truth. We will take the road that leads us to making of, the making of disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, so, here's the thing. When you think about the church, when you think about the church, not just in America, but the church worldwide, there, there's a, 
I think there's a battle that's taking place inside the soul of the church. Whatever's happening outside the church is happening. But the church locally, each one's got to figure out what authority they're going to rest on. And to know that the implications of that are, are going to be great as it begins to be applied. No one's talking about taking the fight, if you like, right to one particular sexually based community. That's not the point. Issues will come and go. The question is, will our church stand for the authority of the scriptures? That's it. If you don't get that question right, you will buy everything. And you'll watch the thing dwindle, by the way. So, as we start to think about this, don't mishear me. Don't think that what I think our first fight is, is it coming to the homosexual community. It's not. It's figuring out how we're going to be on the same page as it relates to this. And by the way, that was Timothy's first fight. Because there were already two individuals that had decided they thought they knew it was authoritative. And Paul said, I've handed them over. You can relegate them to that authority. So where do we really start then? I mean, where do we really start? You see, if, 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 we're, going, if we're going to really think about this inside our own walls and inside our own selves, I think we have to start the fight back in verse 17. 15, especially. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Where do we start? Christ Jesus came in to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. If you don't believe that, then every person outside of this community that disagrees with you will see you as arrogant. They will see you as bigoted. They will see you in a way they want nothing to be a part of. If you do not preach this to yourself and believe it, it is so important. God's word has to live in us first. It's only by the self-preaching of the gospel each day that we will have anything to say to anyone else because it's living inside of us. As soon as we become about causes and politics, we've lost the message. So here Paul is just reminding. As much as he could go back to the fact that he's an apostle, the fact that he's a leader in the church, where does he begin his true child in the faith? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. What is my greatest gift to you? It's me preaching that message to myself and you receiving the benefit of it. That will, have, uh, that will wash over our conversations. It will wash over our transition and change. It will wash over us as we think about people coming and people going, when we have disagreements, when we have difficulties. That's where we begin and end. And this thing here is, is the most important thing we could ever have in our hands as we think about what we're going to do together. A couple of years ago, uh, <laughs> I went to Canada for a retreat to Lethbridge, Alberta, for a friend of mine. And uh, it was farm country. And the last day of the retreat, he said, the one thing we like to do together uh, is shoot guns. I'd never really shot one before. So I thought, why not? I'm in. And um, they, they handed me some kind of a, I guess it was a shotgun, and they were doing the clay pigeon thing, and I missed like all of them. Uh, and I kept trying. And then there was like a 16-year-old girl next to me. She was hitting every one of them. Boom, boom, boom. Thinking maybe her pigeons are bigger, you know. Uh, maybe they're suspended in the air. And they were making it even harder. They were, they were whipping them out there. And just bam, bam, bam. You know, 
I, here, here, was this, here was this, you know, weapon in my hand. I didn't really know how to use it. Um, and here was a person, a teenage person, that knew exactly how to use it. And they were good with it. And, and when, you, when, you think, when you think about the, the weapon in your hand, for the first thing it's supposed to do is to become a mirror in your soul. You're supposed to be able to look at yourself in relation to it and know that you need a savior. Then you, after you come to that realization, you see it like a flashlight that it illumines your pathway to personal holiness. That's the way the law is good for those who use it lawfully that Paul had talked about earlier on in the chapter. This, this thing that we have here is precious. That's why Isaac wanted us to stand when he preached here uh, back in May of last year. That's why we continue the practice. But we don't want these things to become rituals where we do these things publicly and say, oh, you know, the word of God. And then the rest of the week, we, we live as if it doesn't mean anything. We have to learn how to use this thing that God has given to us because we'll all have our own fears, our doubts, our insecurities. We will all bump into people that disagree with us, sometimes stridently for some of the things that we believe. And we're going to have to figure out how do we humbly, how do we humbly interact with the people around us, knowing of the kind of pushback that we'll continue to get. Timothy was called. He was entrusted with a word here. He was entrusted with, with commands. He was going to have to figure out how to speak them, stand for them, knowing that there was going to be pushback on the outside, but especially on the inside. And the same thing I think is true with us. We first have to understand for ourselves what kind of fight we're going to have to wage in our own conscience. And then secondly, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to do this together. Because the further along we go here in this country, the, the more pushback we're going to get from people, not simply on one particular issue, but it's going to be, and it already has been, on a range of issues. And we're going to have to figure out what our authority is that we're resting on. What, what rock we're really going to stand on. I'm praying that as we continue as a church, we'll become more and more confident in the same kinds of things that Paul was confident to give Timothy. Let me pray. Father, We think about um, all, all the things that could potentially um, shipwreck us privately, and it's enough to it's enough to burden us to the point of tears. Think about our own sinful patterns, reactions, responses, ways of life. And, and that's enough to think about even what's beyond us in our culture is enough to just cause us to get in our bed, pull the covers over, and not want to come out. And we know that the only, the only hope that we have is the fact that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, rescue us, and that he's given us this um, authoritative book to be able to live our lives uh, according to his will and way uh, especially when we go out of bounds and to constitute ourselves. We know, Lord, that you've given us this book to constitute ourselves. We pray that you'll help us to grow in our confidence of you uh, as we try to apply these things. But Lord, we, we pray for courage. We, we pray for wisdom um, as we do that together. And especially, Lord, we know that as we get into the content even of this book, as we think about men's and women's issues, as we think about praying, as we think about all these other things as it relates to leadership, that you just help us, Lord, to have a humble and contrite approach to the application of these things so that more people supernaturally we pray, Lord, that more people would be intrigued and want to read the Bible as a result of what's coming out of our mouths and what is displayed by our lives. 
Help us, God, we pray in that as a church so that we might see many people come to Christ this next season of time. That's what we want, Lord. Same way as our African brother exclaimed last week, we do the same here and stand shoulder to shoulder with him. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.